Very lovely. Good morning, colleagues. Pleasure to see colleagues already joining. Um, we're expecting still quite some people to join. So uh, I propose we give it another couple of minutes, but not more, because we have quite a, a nice, but also a, a well-filled agenda. Uh, so I will not punish the people that are coming well on time, um, but still giving the people that are still entering, uh, give them uh, the time to join before we uh, really uh, kick off this session. So bear with us for two minutes, Max. And then um, we take it away. Thanks. Okay, I think we can, uh, we can start. Colleagues are still joining, but um, I propose we start. It's five minutes past ten, Paris time, at least. So uh, let's uh, let's kick off. Again, a very uh, lovely good morning to uh, all your colleagues. It's great to have you uh, already online. Um, my name is for those who haven't met me, but given the names and faces that I see online. Um, I guess I met many of you before, but my name is Nick. I'm a, a senior advisor in the Sigma team, leading the small um, team in Sigma on uh, service design and delivery and, uh, and digital. Great to have you uh, all online together with our speakers for this uh, first uh, webinar in a series uh, of webinars that we're organizing. Um, as some of you might know, um, we have created this, what I would call a tradition with Sigma to organize a series of webinars. We have done this um, in previous years related to topics on live events, related to topics uh, on uh, digital services uh, and, and others. You can find all of these, uh, the material, the recordings, you can find all of these uh, online on our website if you're still interested in these. Uh, this year, 2023, we are uh, continuing um, with this tradition of um, organizing this series. So this is the first uh, in the series uh, on behavioral insights. A second one we are planning, and the date is to be confirmed, but it will be early June on artificial intelligence in service delivery, so challenges and opportunities. After summer, second half of the year, we are planning a webinar on omni and, and multi-channel approaches related to service design and delivery. And uh, towards the end of the year, we will do an update on a, the AI does, on the new interoperability act, uh, aspects related to operability, but also digital identity uh, on things that the commission is working, but also uh, we as Sigma and wider OECD uh, are working. So these are all upcoming topics, upcoming teams that you can expect. Um, and just for you to know that this is the first one with which we are kicking off. Kicking off um, by showing you the agenda, I will immediately hand over uh, to the kind colleague Florian Hauser from the Geneer European Commission. Uh, after Florian, we have the great pleasure to have uh, Chiara Farazzani, who is the, uh, the lead behavioral scientist, but I would say the leading lady in OECD working on uh, behavioral insights. And Chiara will take us into, well, what is this uh, behavioral insights? Um, what is this all about? But also what uh, is the OECD in general uh, doing on this, uh, we would say, fascinating topic. 
After Chiara, uh, Mariam Shama uh, from the uh, French Ministry of Transformation and Public Administration, um, senior advisor there in the Behavioral Insight Unit, will illustrate uh, all of the concepts and methodologies by the practical application in the case of, of France. So really by documenting and illustrating this with some very tangible uh, and concrete examples, cases, that will be for sure uh, also inspirational for, for all of you. And then to close the list of speakers, we are uh, privileged to have Minister Milva Economy, Minister of State for Standards and Services uh, in Albania with us today. And Milva will then also uh, reflect on um, yeah, what are the possibilities, the options, maybe challenges, um, to apply some of these thinking, doing, practice, uh, also in Western Balkans at large, but particularly in Albania, uh, I would say. In all of this, we will, uh, we will invite questions, we will stimulate discussion, um, but we will also have like a formal discussion towards the end. But after each speaker, you will also have the chance uh, to intervene, to interact and to, to ask questions. Good. Um, before I stop sharing, um, this uh, session is recorded. We will uh, put the recording online, all the materials as well. Um, we will send you the materials uh, afterwards and also the uh, future invitations uh, for other uh, events. Thank you so much for now. I will, with this, stop sharing and kindly hand over to Florian Hauser. Florian, who is the, the team lead on public administration reform in uh, DG Near, for his kind welcome, but also some words of content introduction. Florian, please, over to you. Thank you very much, Nick. As you can see on the screen, um, I changed my name to Nick Tice as well, uh, because it was high time we clone Nick, because he does so uh, great, great work. So good morning. Uh, welcome to all colleagues. Uh, Minister Economy, it's amazing you, you take uh, charge of this. Uh, it's really a, a great topic. I was uh, you know, sending out information on this seminar in, inside of the commission. And the colleague said, oh, this is so cool. Yeah. And why is it so cool? And this is very rare in, in public administration that somebody says it's actually cool. And, um, and I find it cool because it's so counterintuitive. I remember an, a, a case example we put also in our public administration toolbox of the commission. And it was with uh, police in Ghana. And uh, the policy goal was to reduce uh, corruption. So there was a, a policy to pay policemen more salary, assuming that this would reduce uh, uh, corruption or the need to be corrupt. And then when they increased the salaries, they found that there was the corruption also increased. So it's very counterintuitive. So I, this behavioral insights is, is, is very interesting. And what it also means is you really need to experiment in order to understand how people behave. It's very complex. And I wanted just to share with you that we take this very seriously also in the European Commission and also in, in the European uh, policy making. And we have now a, a competence center on behavioral insights. And I will share with you uh, in, in a minute, uh, just to show you the, the website. But the, the basic uh, approach, uh, we call it do it. Yeah, do it. And that's actually an acronym. So for do, we have first D, define. Define what is the behavioral element in the policy. The O is observe, observe the behavior and try to understand it. And for the it, we have identify, so identify policy options to address this behavior. And T is for test, test the effectiveness of these policy options. So this is our basic uh, approach. And uh, I, I like that you it creates an attitude, an attitude of experimentation. I think this is very important for for public administration because not everything is automatic. We assume a lot, but the reality is very different. So not wanting to take your time, I will just um, share my screen for one minute because, let's see, can you see this? It's, yes, Florian. Yeah, so yeah. we have our, it's our joint uh, research center, the science service of the European Commission. 
And I'm not sure you can see the actual website, but it's very easy. You Google it, Competence Center on Behavioral Insights, and you see they explain what they do. You find uh, many, in, you can even also request support from them. Uh, and you see different topics, yeah, for example, in agriculture, in climate and environment, in communication, and there are many case examples and many tools and, and resources. So if you want to, after this uh, seminar, uh, dig further into this topic, and I'm, I'm sure the, the OECD has uh, also excellent uh, material, but we, we also do indeed, so you have even, even more. So this is what I wanted to show you. And with that, I wish you a successful seminar and I'm really uh, looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Florian, for the kind intro, the kind welcome, but also sharing this uh, this very interesting and useful information uh, already at the start uh, of this, uh, this event, uh, because we are fully aware that the topic itself on behavioral insights, um, although very interesting and fascinating, it's also still very fresh, new, maybe unknown, to a big extent still well, also unused um, in the regions where we as Sigma are working with, um, which is the Western Balkans clear, but also happy to see that uh, many colleagues from the uh, Eastern Partnership countries uh, also joining today, colleagues from Moldova, uh, from Armenia, from Georgia. Um, so that was also the purpose of, of this event, to put some concepts clear, some methodologies clear, some well, rationale, um, some opportunities, challenges, but also to illustrate this, uh, how it can work, how it could work, uh, and maybe also how it will work in some of your uh, countries. So thanks again, Florian, for this intro and for the uh, support all over uh, to these events, webinars, but to Sigma and the countries uh, in uh, overall. I think with this, we... Um, can move to Chiara, as that who is the uh, the lead person in OECD to think to work uh, on this be uh, whole behavioral insights, and she is the best person placed to give us an insight in behavioral insights. So please, Chiara, take it away. The floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Nick, and thanks to uh, to all Sigma really for organizing today and bring us together. It's a real honor for me to be with you today, and thanks also for all the people who decided to to listen to us. Um, Nick, just confirming that you can see my my screen. Perfect. Um, so we the time we have together. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time, but I thought about focusing on three different things for my presentation. First of all, I would like to do a little bit of a refresher of why behavioral insights and behavioral in science, science is important for government, both in the design of public policies, but also in the design and implementation of public services. Then second, I would like to provide some examples because examples really are the best way to, to get familiar to, to this. And um, so we'll provide some classic examples from the early days of uh, applied behavioral insights. Um, and finally, we'll share some of the work that we're doing at the OECD with the international community of behavioral insights experts. So I always like to start with the why. Uh, so why behavioral insights is important. Where when you think about it, most public policy challenges involve human behavior. Um, so think about energy use. This is top of mind for many of us um, in the environmental and green transition. But also when you have, are asked to pay taxes or when you are looking for your next job or even when you are deciding which schools to, to send your kids to. But also things like elections and very important topics such as misinformation and disinformation nowadays. These are just some examples. But the important thing is that even if we know that human behavior is very important, we still often assume an unrealistic model of human behavior. What does it mean? 
Um, you might be familiar with something that is called the dual processing theory that was first introduced by um, the Nobel Prize Daniel Kahneman with other colleagues. And it says that our behavior is driven by two systems. Now, this is just a metaphor, but I think it's a great way um, to have a, a fair good understanding of um, you know, how human behavior is driven. We have a, a fast system, which is automatic, low cost, and intuitive. So typically a system that we would, you would use if I ask you, what's the result of two by two? You don't need to think about it, right? Uh, it's automatic. And it's also um, the system that you would use uh, to ride a bike. You don't need to think about it uh, if you know how to ride a bike. Uh, the other system is a slower system. So it's called system two, which is analytic, typically high cost and used for deliberate decisions. So typically you would use this system when I ask you, what's the results of 37 by 18? I don't know uh, for you, but in my case, definitely, I need to think about it. Um, and it's typically also the system you will use um, when you are doing something new. For example, when you're learning to, to ride a bike for, for the first time. Now, what I'm telling all this, um, because the fact is that many policies and programs are actually designed thinking that we all use system two. Uh, all the time. While we actually know that humans, whenever we can, we will go with the, uh, the easiest options. And this is, makes a lot of sense from the evolutionary perspective. Um, so whenever we can, uh, as humans, we naturally use our system one. And this system is, of course, very prone to biases and a lot of shortcomings. And so uh, very often, uh, you know, with public services designed uh, for uh, assuming that we always use our slow system, it means that it creates a lot of issues. Um, now, to get to to explain this to you in a in a more concrete way, I would like to kind of give you some examples. Um, but really something to to keep in mind of what is behavioral science and applied behavioral science is nothing but um, something that apply empirically tested results. So results coming from experiments, as Florian was saying, truly design public policies with humans in mind. Um, so trying to design uh, policies and services with the grain of human behavior. Um, so let's get straight into some examples. You might be familiar with the concept of nudge, um, which is a book that was uh, written in 2008 by um, Richard Thaler and Cass Stein. And so these ideas of applied behavioral science has been used and implemented by many different governments over the years. And I will start with some of the very first examples here. For example, uh, human behaviors um, and behavioral and science has been used a lot in redesigning communication. This is an example from Australia, from the New South Wales government, one of the first units around the world uh, doing behavior and science. And what you can see on the left is uh, the, the business as usual um, letter that was sent uh, to collect uh, payments of fines. And this is a very simple example to show you that what this team did was just redesign the letter to make the, the call of action much clearer for, for users and for citizens. Uh, so they make it easier for people to understand what to do, when, and how. Super easy. And uh, they did an experiment to see if really there was a difference in, um, you know, increase the payment of fines, and they found a significant difference. Uh, so this is a, a, just a very simple example to show you that sometimes when, as, as public servants, when we design communication or services, we forget about the essence of the message. In this case, it was a clear call to action that it was very difficult to find in this example that you have on the left. This has been used in many different policy areas, but it's a very powerful thing. And the beauty of applied behavioral science is that not only these people redesign communications, but they also test to what extent did this work, this works or not. 
as Florian was saying before, we also have examples of backfiring effect. So you, it's super important to always test to what extent the, the new uh, public service or the new communication is actually, actually working or, or not. Other very famous examples comes from um, tax administration. So the Behavioral Insights team uh, in uh, the UK back in 2011, um, they started uh, an experiment which saved uh, the tax administration in the UK 200 million pounds in just one year in tax debt with just redesigning one letter. So you might wonder how they did that. Well, they did something super simple. They, they took the business as usual letter that uh, tax administration was sending to people who were late in paying their taxes and they added one single sentence. They added this sentence, um, nine out of 10 people pay their taxes on time. You might think that this is a very, a very kind of simple addition, um, but um, you know, just by highlighting the social norm and what other people around you are doing, they were able to raise an extra 200 million um, pounds in tax debt. Uh, so people suddenly um, started to, to pay their taxes more compared to, to, to the control group. And again, this was tested in a, in a scientific and empirical way. You might also think that this is great, but I show you one example from Australia and one example from the UK. Uh, and we know that culture and uh, social factors are very important. So in the early days, you know, we were uh, kind of asking ourselves if this is just an Anglo-Saxon thing, <laughs> if this, um, if these behavioral insights um, tricks might also work in other cultures. And so um, this has been replicated in multiple contexts. So I just wanted to show you a very similar experiment, always in tax administration, done in Guatemala. So completely different geographical area, completely different culture. And so these were the results from a very similar experiment in which they design different letters using uh, social norms, exactly as they did in the UK, and equally compared to the contra group, so the people who received the business as usual letter from the tax administrator, uh, the difference between the worst performing letter, so this one in gray, and the best one, um, if rolled out nationally, is over 300,000 um, US dollars of savings, which is uh, kind of quite impressive. And so the, the beauty of using these, uh, these methods is that not only you can shift the dial in and you can measure if something works, but you can also uh, measure the return on investment. Uh, of course, this is possible in tax administration, but you can uh, apply these to many different policy areas. Um, just another uh, slide quickly to say that this has been replicated even in Indonesia uh, recently, just last year, this time with more than one, one, uh, 11 million taxpayers pay in Indonesia. So what I'm showing here is kind of um, some of the results we are pretty confident uh, with um, and the fact that this can work in multiple cultures and, and, and countries. Now, we don't know about the Balkans as much. So of course it will be uh, super interesting to try and apply the lesson learned and the things that we know works somewhere else also in, in the context of the Balkan regions. Another example from Australia, always with this concept from uh, social norms. So providing social pressure. This time, instead of uh, changing, wanted to change the behavior of citizens, um, the behavioral economics team of the Australian government, um, they wanted to change the behavior of medical doctors. So this is also the beauty of behavioral insights. Uh, you can think about different target groups, not only citizens, but also uh, you know, service providers and in general, different categories. So in this case, it was trying to change the behavior of medical doctors. And the problem that we, we had in Australia is that Australia, compared to other countries, there's a very high prescription rates of antibiotics. And we know that this is not great because there's something called antimicrobial resistance, um, which is basically the fact that the more antibiotics we, we use uh, worldwide, 
the more um, uh, super bugs, as we they are called, will become resistant to antibiotics. And so worldwide, WHO also, they always uh, try to reduce the prescription of antibiotics when this is not useful. For example, when you have a virus. Um, so what we did when I was working in the behavioral economics team of the Australian government in Canberra, so we designed a letter to medical doctors and we use exactly the same techniques, so social norms. And we just said, well, we, 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 we focus on the 20% highest prescribers in medical doctors. And we told them, well, you prescribe more antibiotics than 90% 90 90 of your colleagues in Canberra. And we also added a nice, um, a nice graph to show these, to put a little bit of pressure. So I wanted just to quickly show you the results. Uh, these were the results before uh, we started the, uh, the trial. As you can see during winter, which in Australia is around July, August and September, there's a peak in prescription of antibiotics, as you can see here. Um, and there wasn't any difference across the different intervention groups. But now look at the, the people uh, uh, who didn't receive our letter versus the people who received our letters. There was a significant difference in prescription rates and this was very successful. And we also discovered that we had this effect on changing behavior of medical doctors even one year after we sent the letter, um, which is um, pretty impressive. One thing that you, you, you will see in many of the examples that Mariam and I will show is that one issue on behavioral insights is to kind of measure the behavior change over time. You know, to what extent the effect that you're, uh, you're triggering stays over time. In these nice examples, we, we managed to, to demonstrate that the behavioral change stayed for over one year after the intervention. Um, just wanted to mention that uh, I show you mainly examples from, um, you know, central government, mainly federal government in the case of Australia, but there's a lot going on at local government level as well. Especially, I encourage you to have a look at this report from the Behavioral Insights team in, especially in US cities, in which they really worked a lot with uh, public service providers at the municipal and local level. So in this example, um, for example, they were trying to boost the uh, attendance of uh, citizens to doctor appointment. And they discovered that by just telling people that they've been selected uh, for a medical uh, appointment, increased the number of people showing up by 40%. And this was targeted, especially to those people who never go to the doctors. I'm sure you always have a friend like this. Um, my, my dad, for example, never go to the doctor. And this is problematic for prevention issues. Um, and so this was very successful in boosting the attendance to, to that, especially in low income um, target groups. Now, um, I also wanted to share the other side of nudge in a way. So as, as I told you, um, nudge or everything that I show you until now are sort of improvements to the choice architecture that make it easier for people to, to fulfill their intentions. There's also kind of the bad brother of nudge, uh, which recently has been called sludge. And sludge are nothing more than frictions or things that make it harder for people to fulfill their intention. Um, this is a book that has been written by Cass Sustain and it's it's great. It's, um, I encourage you to, to have a look. And um, really it, it, it tells about, you know, these excessive and unjustified frictions that make it more difficult for consumers, but also for citizens and users at large uh, to do what we, we need to do. To give an example, um, there's a lot of sludge or frictions in the private sector, for sure. Um, think about, you know, uh, for example, in insurance companies, how difficult it is to, um, to opt out of, of a subscription model that uh, puts you in like an automatic renewal of insurance companies. Uh, and this is 
like they're using this technique of default subscription, um, not only in insurance, but in many different things at the gym, at the magazine. Um, and so this is a classic use of behavioral science to uh, increase profit, profit in the private sector. So these are examples of sludge that is deliberate. So private companies are doing this on purpose to, to increase profit. Now, in the um, public sector and in design and delivery of public services, very often sludge or these frictions are not deliberate, but are unintentional. So think about all the cases where information is hard to find when you are trying to access uh, a service online, for example, uh, forms that are super difficult to understand and complete or excessive wait times uh, to, for, for public services, or also very complex decision points. All these are examples of, of sludge. And I'm sure you can think about uh, personal experiences in, um, I don't know, many different things uh, from having a visa to renewing a passport to um, register a newborn in your family. Now, one thing that uh, I find very inspiring is what the New South Wales government is doing in Australia. And so they created a, um, a method and a framework that is really going beyond classic user journey and user experience for public services. So they created something that's called a sludge audit method, that it's a standardized method to identify sludge and quantify the time, the cost, and the quality of experience of interacting with government. And so this is uh, really much informed by behavioral science, and it's basically completing and complementing a lot of the design principles in user experience, for example. Um, just wanted to, yeah, this is kind of the journey uh, to do that. So there is both a behavioral journey map, but also a lot of quantitative analysis um, on trying to estimate time and money. Um, but uh, what I wanted to show is one, one example of a sludge audit that they did on home building license. When you have to, uh, when you want to renew your house in Australia, as many other countries, you need to have a building license. And on average, they discovered that it took 26 hours to apply for a new building license. Uh, governments didn't know about that. The, the service providers didn't know how, how, how difficult it was. And so they did a full um, kind of customer interaction points and behavioral journey. And they, they changed that and they managed to save to government approximately 80,000 uh, Australian dollars per year. So this is important because it's not only saving time and money for citizens, but also for government. And the beauty of this sludge audits methodology is that it really gives you um, a return on investment or um, the kind of in interventions that you are doing. Um, we are trying to uh, to bring this at the international level. Uh, so uh, it's we are exploring collaboration on this, but it's something that, of course, you can imagine to do in multiple jurisdictions at the same time and to coordinate international efforts to uh, compare how public services are designed and implemented across different uh, countries. Now, I wanted also to briefly uh, kind of present to you the kind of work that we do at the OECD very quickly. Um, so at the OECD, what we do is basically three different things. Um, so we, we have three work streams. One, it's about convening. Uh, the second one is about enabling the use of behavioral insights in government. And the third one is about advising government. So for the first one, for the first bucket, um, we basically foster a community of behavioral insights experts around the world. This is a map from 2018 showing you all the different behavioral insights units around the world, applying these methods to government. And now from 2018, um, the number of units has increased massively. And so this is just a graph to show you all the different, the increase in the number of units over the years. 
and 50% of the new behavioral insights units were created in the last four years only. Um, so this is definitely a tendency that is going up uh, a lot. So in 2021, uh, we launched a global network, network of behavioral insights experts in government, and we have more than 100 experts uh, from 46 countries. And it's really for us a space to discuss common challenges and opportunities to collaborate. We are very lucky to uh, have this network chaired by the government of Canada, France, and the US. And I'm super pleased to have Mariam, Dr. Mariam Chamat with us today, who's the co-chair from, from France of this network. Um, but to give you an idea, uh, we are trying also to kind of in, be as inclusive as possible. Um, and so there's plenty of public um, tools that you can use. So if you go on, on our website, you can see a dynamic map of all the different units around the world. And if you click on uh, every single dot, you can have a look at how many people work in the team. And this is also connected to a knowledge base, so a project repository. So every unit can share the projects that they're currently working on. Uh, and this is great if you want to have a look at uh, what the international community is doing. For example, if you are curious about uh, you know, what is being doing in consumer protection, you can have a look and you can select the policy area and filter for all the different projects. And this is, I think, a great way to share knowledge in real time instead of waiting for a report to be published, uh, which really makes knowledge sharing a little bit too slow, too slow for at least for, um, for the experience of working in government. And in the second bucket of our work, uh, we do plenty of thing, inclu things, including training, and uh, we basically try to, uh, to provide standards and tools that people can use uh, in government. So for example, we created this basic framework, which is a framework really to apply behavioral science from the beginning to then, then to implementation of policy. Um, and it's designed for anyone working in government, not only for behavioral science practitioners. We also wanted to, um, to standardize a bit the, the ethical use of behavioral science in public policy. So together in collaboration with the French government and Marianne, we put together um, a, a good practice principle for ethical use of behavioral science in public policy. And as usual with ethics, there's also always a risk to be very theoretical, and we wanted to avoid that. And so we put together a checklist uh, for on ethics and behavioral science, because as I can show, as I showed you before, you can use behavioral science for good, but also for bad, as we have many examples in the private sector. And so we put together a checklist, which is a practical tool uh, really to check the most important ethical pitfalls when designing a behavioral science intervention, and also prompting questions to, to prompt a deeper discussion on ethical challenges. And finally, the full guide with a lot of case studies and examples. Lastly, the last part of our work, which is the largest, is about advice to, to government. And that's where we will run project together with government. Um, Recently, last year, we published one report on misinformation, and it was in collaboration with the, the government of Canada and France. And this is publicly available. You can have a look. Um, and it was a great experience. Mariam was part of it as well. Um, and this was the first cross-border collaboration, uh, really to try and understand why people share fake news online. And if there's anything that we can do uh, about it and do a little test on an experiment to try and tackle the spread of misinformation. So uh, the, 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 we, we collaborated with the Privy Council in Canada who run the experiment and uh, we discovered many different things, but long story short, we designed some prompts for people to, to, uh, to prompt them before seeing fake news and true news. And we found two main things. We found that many people share fake news even when they don't believe fake news to be true, which was interesting in itself. And we also discovered that providing tips on how to spot misinformation 
um, could really reduce intention to share full inf false information. And so as you can see in this graph, um, this little intervention managed to reduce intention to share fake news by 21%, which is pretty massive when you think about the fact that it was just one single um, intervention. Um, so just the summary of funding from this report that I encourage you to, to have a look at um, is that, yes, yeah, some individual may share news, even fake news, even when they do not believe them to be true. That giving tips on digital media literacy uh, can reduce intention to share fake news. And also, importantly, we found that um, there's a lot of differences in terms of trust uh, in institutions, but also on how we consume information. And this really shape our beliefs and our behavior in sharing this information. Um, I know that we don't have a lot of time, so I will try to, to be short, but I hope that I gave you an idea of the kind of work that uh, we do at the OECD. Um, now, to make it practical, I, I put in here a couple of potential kind of next steps for you to engage with the, this work. Um, so we have this uh, OECD Behavioral Insights Network, and we, we try to be as inclusive as possible. So please, if you're interested in knowing more about this, get in touch. You can also use all the different tools that we, we provide online. Also, uh, maybe you can share, Nick, the, um, the link that Florian sent uh, from the European Commission. We collaborate a lot with GRC and uh, it's all these, th th there's a lot online that you can actually use uh, for your work. But we, all, we can also have with more tailored um, services such as training, and also projects on, on, specific, um, on specific part of your work. Um, so I will stop here, Nick. I know that we are lucky to have Mariam with us, uh, but maybe before that, of course, I'm super happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. No, thank you indeed. Thank you indeed, Chiara. This was, uh, this was excellent. I mean, laying out the foundations, laying out the concepts, methodologies, but also showing some practice. Uh, what is done, in different contexts, uh, different cultures. Uh, so this is really appreciated. And then also in complementing what Florian said from commission side, that there is a lot of work going on uh, there, a lot of support that is and can be provided, but also from your team and, and from the OECD in general, that this complements really nicely. So really, really appreciate it. Just uh, echoing your uh, kind invitation, if colleagues present here, and from the different countries present here, if they also would like to join the network, um, that this is open, that this is not restrictive. Uh, so also there that colleagues can just get in touch with you uh, to see how this can be uh, made possible in uh, in practice. Um, thanks also for being so punctual, uh, Chiara. Much appreciated. This allows us to open up to the floor for taking a couple of questions. I would say the most burning and urgent ones in this first round and then we can come back uh, later on uh, in some more uh, plenary general discussion so if there are some immediate questions just raise your uh, virtual hand we know the drill by now just raise your virtual hand and then briefly introduce yourself where you're coming from and then uh, launch your uh, question i see as the first one uh, nyamza please hi my name is nyamza i work for the giz project uh, on uh, EU integration. Not, not really a question, just uh, wanted to, to add that we did. Sorry, Nyamza, you're... Nyamza, you got muted. Yeah, oh, yeah. The, the host muted me, so now I know it. Uh, so as I said, we did this uh, behavior analysis also with the tax administration uh, here, firstly with the World Bank and then with the university of Pristina, and we could clearly see that the uh, uh, taxpayers that we called paid uh, significantly more or declared more taxes, not only on VAT, which the uh, call uh, was made or the nudge was made towards them, but also uh, uh, other ta ta taxes. And I know that similar experiments, if I may say so, were done with the tax administration uh, in cooperation with the World Bank also in Albania. Just uh, maybe to um, 
open up since I think Chiara said that they don't know if there is uh, anything was done here. Just uh, yeah, also to pass on this uh, information. Thank you. Palimenderi, thank you so much, Jamza, for having you online and for this kind uh, contribution. I also see some interactions in the chat. Um, so maybe I would uh, open the floor to you, uh, Goran, because you have a question I see there. So just maybe put it uh, just in, in plenum here. Goran, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nick. Uh, if I have uh, to choose, I would rather ask a question regarding the chat GPT, because that is something that probably interests the most everyone at the, the current days. Uh, it reflects the use of artificial intelligence and uh, and also machine learning. So, Chiara, thank you for this great presentation. And I was wondering uh, how can uh, behavioral insights as such help uh, or improve the chat GPT in a way that is more engaging and effective? And uh, we have recently learned that Italy has banned chat GPT because there are se several issues such as exactly fake news and machine learning per se uh, requires a lot of data. So the big question is whether those data that are being used to feed in the system are accurate. And, uh, and so my question is, how would you think that behavioral insights can improve hypothetically chat GPT that is more engaging and effective and that delivers personalized nudges and other interventions directly to the citizens uh, in a more accurate way, if you can answer this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Goran. This is a very big question, and so it could be answered in many different ways. Um, so first of all, I will start just by, by a little bit of history of how artificial intelligence has been used until now in complement with behavioral science and data science. Typically, what it could be used for and it has been used for is to tailor interventions a little bit more. So the classic examples that I showed to you, as you notice, they, they were exactly the same for anybody, right? And so this, this is great. And we know that on average, this can work at the average level. But over the years, at least in the last six to seven years, um, there were plenty of interventions that had be, as, have been tailored to specific way to, to the specifics, the specific behavioral factors of, of every user. And so intelli artificial intelligence can be very instrumental in this. So instead of having exactly the same messages, message for everybody, you can tailor message uh, for many different things. And this is something that governments have not really explored as much until now. There are clear uh, ethical challenges in doing this uh, because it's on one hand using personal data and tracking um, uh, citizens. And also there is a, a problem of like using different messages and different leverages uh, Across across citizens, which might um, you know induce a lot of inequality, per se. So this is a little bit of the history, but things have moved on quite a lot since uh, since the use of like artificial intelligence for behavioral science, and now we think that you know with the democratization of um, instruments such as ChatGPT. It's, it's, it's a much larger scale, a behavioral experience of interacting with artificial intelligence that many more people now have. And I think one thing that hasn't been explored enough is really this interaction between human and artificial intelligence. You know, what, what are the, the biases and the heuristics in the interaction between these two systems? Uh, a human brain and um, you know a, a series of algorithms and um, such as such as ChatGDP, and I think it hasn't been explored enough, and I hope to see much more going on 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 that, um, and also because as, as you can imagine, you know, in the interaction with an artificial intelligence, our own behavior can change drastically. For example, and this is just intuition, I don't think I have seen any evidence on this, but on ChatGBT, for example, people might be much more straightforward with an artificial intelligence than with a human colleague. 
So I think that the, you know, the data that ChatGPT is currently uh, accumulating on many different things could be extremely uh, private in a way. And so even if, of course, if Ital Italian decision to, to ban ChatGPT for the time being uh, might be questionable, uh, I think there's, there's a real ground um, and evidence because we don't know enough about how people behave uh, in the interaction with, with a democratized system such as ChatGPT. And so as, as a suggestion, I think that it would be really great to start and run you know, tests and experiments in collaboration with platforms such as ChatGPT, but also many other open AI platforms to really try to understand uh, what is going on in there. Would it, does it mean that uh, the checklist, the questionnaire, and the guideline that you prepared with your colleagues in the OECD could hypothetically help in articulating uh, this very prompt and fast AI development and use? Because we also heard Elon Musk and others uh, that have actually urged the, the humankind to reduce the, the speed of AI development. So hypothetically, do you think that these tools that you prepared could articulate and to a certain extent also give preventive measure to having something that is also human in the loop approach rather than only driven by the technology. Absolutely. Um, so I don't think we are there yet. I, I wouldn't say I will be ready uh, tomorrow to start an international collaboration to provide principles on this. But what we had for now is even at the, just at the OECD level, we had good practice principles and standards on AI on ethics, they're excellent. You can have a look. It, there's a legal recommendation on this. And now we have good practice principles on behavioral science. The two, of course, there's many things that are in common, but where we're lacking now is you know, good practice principles and standards in the interaction between, at the behavioral level, uh, between humans and, and AIs. Um, and I think we will see this um, coming in the coming years. But definitely, that's a gap, and it, I think it's our uh, responsibility to, to start think seriously about that. Thank you a lot. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chiara. Thanks, Koran, for the question. Just remind uh, to all of you what I said in the introduction that this is uh, this webinar is the first in the series, and the second one will be dedicated fully to AI, not only generative AI systems, but AI more general, uh, the use of AI. Uh, for um, services, service uh, provision, service design, um, the opportunities, but also also the challenges. And so, thanks, Chiara, for also flagging the the work that that you and OCD in, in general has done and is doing on this um, when it comes to uh, behavioral insights and also AI on the principles, doing a lot of showing well, the positive things, the opportunities but also the, the super important work on, on ethics and setting standards there. So uh, great. With this, I would say many thanks, Chiara, for uh, being available, doing such a great presentation, because I know these days, weeks are super intensive for you with uh, with all the things that are uh, that are going on. Um, you mentioned already and lead nicely into introducing Mariam, uh, because Mariam is, as besides what I said this morning, doing super interesting work from the French side, their uh, senior advisor in the French Behavioral Insights Unit uh, in the ministry. She's also one of the leading people, let's say on the global scale, um, in this uh, behavioral insights uh, practice. So I think we are quite privileged to have Miriam in, in this double role. Uh, so please, Miriam, um, I would pass the floor to you and also bless the screen to you, all yours, Maria. Perfect. Thank you very much, Nick, and thank you, thank you everyone for for the time uh, you're giving to this um, presentation this morning. And also, Chiara, thank you for setting the scene because this way I can directly jump into concrete examples that um, we've done. And um, I, now that you have a bit of background on behavioral insights, so as it was mentioned, I'm a senior advisor in the French uh, behavioral insights unit at. Um, an interministerial directorate of public transformation, um, and a lot of a lot of the work that we do is similar to um, some of the examples that Chiara presented, and we have a lot of collaborations with the OECD. But what I was thinking of presenting to you today was 
um, a little bit more about how our team came together and how we built kind of a unit from scratch. This way you can get a sense of like, if this is something something you want to get into or you want to develop a team, um, what, what it could take to do that. And then I wanted to show you also how we went from classical examples, uh, things that look a lot like the tax, um, tax examples or um, letters that we've worked on to, sort, to things that are a little bit more innovative and I would say um, a bit more um, outside the comfort zone of administrations. And just to show you how those um, examples worked out on uh, consumer protection specifically. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and um, um, we can jump right into it. Um, can you please just confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, okay. positive, Maria. Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, so just to give you um, a bit of a, a sense of where our, our team sits and with which other expertise we collaborate. Um, so as I said, we are in the Direction Interministerielle de la, de la Transformation Publique. And this is a team that sits within um, a recent ministry, of, which, is, which is a ministry of public transformation. And um, basically, we, we are within an innovation team whose mission is to really contribute to creating more human-centered um, public service. And this means that we work with a lot of public innovation networks. We work with uh, labs, innovation labs that we've created, um, uh, we've contributed to creating all over France, there are 100 of them. So we have um, networks of people doing things that are similar to ours. This is one way to spread also innovation um, in at different levels. And we also work on uh, accompanying major innovation projects. I'm going to present some of them and empowering public servants with new methodologies and, and practical tools. Um, so my team uh, specifically um, uh, works on behavioral sciences, and that's what I'm going to, to dig into. But we also work with other expertise, such as service design, and also um, other team members that are more into um, collaborative strategies and coaching. And we also have a sub one part of our team works on co construction with civil uh, society. Uh, so let's get into the behavioral insights part of it. And uh, so that team is also quite small, but as you can see, um, we can we also collaborate with external uh, partners. So either with a group of researchers that work in different behavioral science labs or with external consultancy, such as the behavioral insights team. And so this allows us to uh, have internalized expertise uh, in behavioral science. So for example, I come from a background in cognitive neuroscience where I worked on decision making um, and we other people from our team work on, uh, come also from psychology and neuroscience backgrounds. Uh, we have internal expertise, but we also combine that with external expertise to be able to lead much more projects. So to give you a sense of how all of this uh, came about, and it's, uh, I joined this team in 2016 and uh, at first it was really about trying to see, um, trying to test the interest for behavioral in insights and behavioral science in France. Uh, and what we, what we were able to, to do was uh, put a sort of a sunset clause or a period with a, um, I would say proof of concept, which was from 2018 to two 2020. And back then uh, we were only two team members, myself and, um, Stéphane Giraud, uh, who is now, right now responsible for the whole um, behavioral insights program, and we were allowed, we were able to secure an initial funding um, that allowed us to uh, work on ten initial projects. This meant that for these ten initial projects, we had to pick the right projects and projects that had good return on investment to be able to to show and to um, I mean present uh, good. Uh, impact uh, of, of different of these different projects and so what we did is first of all we did a call for projects to different ministries and other types of administrations uh, to submit topics on which we could work and we had specific selection criteria picking high impact uh, topics so topics that really concern uh, a, a big amount of uh, people the, 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 the population uh, was was quite uh, was an important criteria making sure also that we are tackling behavioral problems and not structural problems so problems on which for example 
uh, financing is not the problem, but really it's a it's an intention action gap uh, issue. Uh, we also targeted projects on which uh, data was available because this would really allow us to uh, to do impact um, analysis and to make sure that really what we uh, what we propose has really made change and to be able to measure um, our interventions. We also had ethical criteria in our call for projects, and we were also wanted to work with administrations that were had, that were highly engaged and that didn't view us as a team that would go do the work and just present it in the end, but we really wanted to co-construct with the administrations and also perhaps to help them build capacity so that after a project, they would also um, um, foster this type of expertise within their, their administrations. So um, with, uh, as you see, we were two team members, so we couldn't do all of this. So we also did a bid to identify consultant teams and researchers that could help us um, do this big ambitious program for two years and uh, based on those results be able to continue the team or just simply stop it and um, say that maybe the return on investment is not good enough. So given that I'm still here, uh, it means that the, the news was actually good and we were able to, um, with this 10 initial projects, show high return on investment and this allowed for new funding, uh, which first of all, Made us uh, grow the team, so we have we are now five fixed team uh, members, and we also have interns through a partnership that we did with the university, and this allows us to um, right now start 30 new projects and also internalize the expertise, even though we're continuing to work with um, external researchers. So as you can see, um, I mean, even if you're a very small team and you want to start uh, BI uh, expertise within your, your administration, there are ways to actually do it in a safe space and uh, to do it step by step in order to make sure that you're um, going in the right direction. So um, we have, as I said, many projects right now since 2018 in, in very different areas, such as uh, health, for example, which is a a very behavioral topic, um, environment, education, uh, justice, and economy, uh, of course. And so uh, it was a bit difficult for me to pick the ones to present to you. But as you'll see, I picked choices, uh, I picked, uh, sorry, examples of projects to present that go from more classical ones to, to the ones that are a bit different than what you would see in usual uh, VI teams. So the first project I wanted to show you uh, looks a little bit like the one that Chiara presented on getting people to pay their uh, their taxes on time. Uh, and so this was, uh, uh, rather than the time uh, the time problem here, what we had was an uh, online payment versus uh, payment by check or by actual money. And so uh, one administration came to see us to tell us that uh, self-employed, um, so entrepreneurs, had a problem with on online payments. So even though in France, since 2019, uh, you are legally obliged to pay your, your social taxes online, uh, for this specific category, there were still a lot of people paying by check or coming and paying uh, on, the desk, on the front desk by money. And this is, this is problematic because it generates a lot of cost of um, processing all that uh, um, touch point and also it can create some fraud and so this was um, quite a problem and so what we what we did on this very first project actually that we worked on in 2018-2019 is um, really trying to see what are the communications that, uh, that they are sending out what is the information that that is being sent out to the self-employed um, taxpayers and we found the letter to be quite complicated quite administrative and a little bit scary. So after um, uh, a work of um, observing, uh, um, calling, interviewing taxpayers, but also listening to phone calls between those self-employed taxpayers and that administration, and trying to see what are what is the guidance, what is the information that they're giving out, um, we found three big categories of uh, barriers to this online payment, and one of them was that. Um, Several of these uh, self-employed taxpayers were quite afraid of paying online because they were um, they were small businesses. They were not used to um, doing things uh, 
I mean, in, in an automatic process way. So they really wanted, felt the need to really go to the desk and see and interact with a person, with a, with a human person. Uh, some of them also had a problem of uh, paying at the last minute. So they would come to the website at really the last moment, maybe the day before or the hour before the deadline. And given that everyone came to the website at the same time, the website crashed. So we had a planification issue. And also um, many of them thought that it was, uh, I mean, they didn't even know that there was a um, obligation to pay online and they didn't know that there was a fine associated uh, to not paying online. So what we did is we simply took the letter that uh, this administration was sending out and we completely simplified it. We made it extremely clear by changing the way the information is presented. And we changed, there is one sentence which, um, which is in, right after the objective, um, which we varied and we had three different versions of the sentence. One of them emphasized social norms, so telling that uh, more than 80% of auto-entrepreneurs or self-employed people in your region pay their social taxes uh, online. Uh, the second version had a reminder of the law and reminded them that there was, there was an obligation and a fine associated to that for non-compliance. And the third one, uh, simply had the planification aid in order to help them come not at the last minute, but really uh, we gave them other types of um, deadlines which were earlier so that they could pay, uh, so that different people could connect at different times and pay separately. So interestingly, um, our predictions on this uh, uh, on this experiment, and we often try to do these types of predictions to see to what extent we are also biased in how we expect um, uh, people to behave. Uh, we, we do this not only if the team predicts, but also we ask the administration to predict how people would, what are the outcomes. And this is also interesting because it, it helps us gain some data points on uh, expectations and perhaps like optimism of administration or maybe pessimism. And so very interestingly, uh, the administration that we worked with told us that um, the problem really was a problem of, of fraud and uh, people maybe trying to, to pay on uh, by check or by money so that they can um, not be tracked or like there was a really uh, big in, um, expectation of fraud. And this was actually not at all what we saw. So the, the most, the biggest problems were really the, the website, uh, the, the lack of clarity and the website. Uh, and it led them to really revise their predictions in the end of the project. But just to come back to this letter, so we tested these three um, types of uh, prompts and we sent out letters to 15,000 self-employed uh, entrepreneurs and the results were quite interesting. Um, all of the letters worked better than the control letter, which is the one that the, the administration sent business as usual. And the one that worked uh, the best was the remind, reminder of the law and the obligation to pay online. Um, it, we, we had a 60% increase of online payment with just this sentence, which is a very good return on investment. And when we went and interviewed some people to understand what, what is the lever, like what, it, what exactly worked in reminding people of the law, um, they told us that uh, the sentence also said, we know you paid by check or by money on the last uh, payment deadline. Please kindly remember that it's you, you have to pay online since 2019. And so they told us that the, uh, the fact that the administration told them that they knew they paid by check or by money, this is what, what prompted them to quickly <laughs> change their behavior. So it's interesting that this is the one that worked the best. And um, it, it now, right now, this administration is continuing to test on the long term whether these same auto-entrepreneurs without this letter or um, with the usual letter are still continuing to pay online and they're testing other versions of this letter. So this, uh, this intervention is quite simple, as you can see, but it had really high return on investment. And it's kind of open also um, the, the floor for a lot of work that we do in our team on simplification because um, administrative forms can be extremely jargonous and uh, don't have clear calls, calls to action. So we work on that uh, on many of our projects. Um, a second project that I wanted to show you was on uh, encouraging the repair of electronic goods. And so in this project, um, we were called by an administration that was working on a 
on a repairability uh, label or index um, that they wanted to put on eight categories of electronics, such as computers, phones, um, washing machines, etc. And uh, they decided that instead of simply taking this, uh, tackling this problem from a, from a logo design point of view, they really wanted to see whether um, this label, this information was being taken into account by people when um, they were buying products. So basically, if you have, for example, a product that has a three over 10 grade of repairability, you, you would know that you're buying something that's fairly not repairable or very difficult to repair. So would that dissuade people from buying those types of products? And this label had two uh, purposes. One of them was, of course, con con information for consumers, but also pressure for people who are building these um, different electronics and to get them to, to, to build more repairable uh, products. So what we did is we, uh, first of all, did a small online study on 2000 consumers, so in a lab setting, uh, which helped us then um, define the, the labels that were the most uh, noticed, that, that were the most understood, and that people took into account. And then we tested this in a real online setting, so on online shopping websites, on 140,000 consumers. And uh, what we saw here is that the visuals that work the best, so the one, the one that, is, um, that I just posted, um, on the top right hand side, um, dissuaded people. So when, when these grades were below uh, five, they dissuaded people to buy uh, products. So it's interesting because um, it didn't work in increasing the, the buying of more repairable products, but it worked in decreasing um, the purchase of ones that were not considered to be repairable. And so right now, um, Three years later, because this was done in 2019, 2020, we're doing a large scale study to see what happened in three years. So first of all, did it get consumers in general to buy more repairable goods? And did it get um, people who are work building these um, electronics to change a little bit their behavior? And we're also working on a new, um, on a new index, which is more uh, sustainability index, which will soon replace um, the repairability one. So um, what is also interesting about this study and I, why I chose it is because right now, um, this index is uh, really, you can find it on every electronic uh, product in France. Uh, so it got scaled to a national level. And the fact that we did this in an experimental setting and it was uh, a rigorous experiment also made people that were around the table that had very different interests, such as NGOs uh, or, for example, um, uh, administrations that were uh, kind of disagreeing on what label would work best. It, it, it really put them around the table because it was a scientific experiment. And so they were really waiting for the scientific consensus and not just uh, an opinion uh, battle. Um, so the third and uh, last project I wanted to show to you uh, is a bit different and I would say a less classical example of what you would expect to find in public administration projects. Uh, it's a project we did with a directorate that works on consumer protection and fraud, uh, fraud repression. And we worked on dark patterns, which, uh, which you are probably all familiar with since um, if you ever went to buy tickets online or or I don't know, um, a, a hotel room or any type of product actually, uh, you are presented with these elements that sometimes are misleading or sometimes coerce the consumer into making choices that they don't necessarily wanted to, that they didn't want to make initially. So for example, you have this time pressure to buy something because in the next uh, 24 hours, the, the price is going to change. Or sometimes you have other types of dark patterns such as sneak in the basket, which is you go to buy something and then you find that in your basket there was an element which you had not picked or the price has increased while the charges were not something you were you were told about initially and so this administration wanted us to work on um, informing the consumers a little bit better about these dark patterns because it represents a high amount of um, uh, damageable uh, fraud every year and many many people are complaining about it 
So initially, this administration, the GCCRF, um, had created sort of a dictionary of all these practices on their website. And uh, it was really in the form of like basically A to Z, and every letter had all the types of dark patterns that you can encounter. And they came to see us to tell us, okay, so people are not coming to read this um, dark pattern information on our website, so we would like you to simplify this information and make it more uh, digestible. Which is interesting, of course, and it's something that they should do. But what we found a bit complicated was uh, how to get consumers to actually come to this website. And I mean, it's not very user centered because users will not necessarily uh, find the drive, the motivation to go read all this information. And when would they do it? Would they do it after or before they are um, they are in the fraud uh, situation? So. Um, what we did, what we thought we should do instead was reaching consumers at the right time uh, and in the right place. So we decided to work on designing um, a coffee machine, which is a completely, um, I mean, we invented this page, which is called Di Bartolo. So um, we invented several characteristics for the coffee machine by saying that there were only 42 left. So we used all the dark patterns that were usually uh, used on these websites by telling people that um, some of, many were reserved or, or delivered and we also made the price extremely attractive because it went from 300 uh, euros to 60 euros for a specific period of time and so we also invented fake uh, reviews and put a timer to put pressure on the consumers so we really kind of simulated what a website would do using many dark patterns and we posted this, um, this, the ad for this coffee machine on social media, so on Facebook specifically, for a period of one month and a half. And we, uh, the experiment ran, ran in this way, where we had consumers came on the website, they clicked and they could order the coffee machine. And then they were randomized into three groups. One control group, which were, were told that they would receive the coffee machine in two weeks. Of course, they only put their, their emails, they didn't put their their cards or anything, so they didn't purchase it, but they, they ordered it. So we told them that once you receive it, you can pay the, the coffee machine. Um, the second group was a group um, which we called the awareness group. So we only put a pop-up telling them, um, watch out, you were about to uh, fall into a, a trap of buying a machine that didn't exist. And we, so this was, just like an awareness pop-up and then we gave them five rules of thumb to protect themselves online next time they go on online shopping websites and the third group was a quick online training group so not only did they get the pop-up but they were also told them here you can take seven minutes to do an online training to see if you can detect dark patterns in a better manner and so what we wanted to do uh, after that is target everyone, all these groups, with a new ad to see which ones, which of the three groups would get re-victimized. And this would allow us to test our interventions and see if it really works in getting people to be, um, to have more awareness about dark patterns. So before I show you the results, just also tell you that um, on the website, in the um, Condition générale de vente, which I think would translate to like the the conditions, you know, that is the CGV that you see on every website. We had put all the information about this experiment, saying that this is not a real coffee machine. This is an experiment, but um, very very little people actually opened those and and read them, which also shows that there is a big problem on on that type of legal information, which nobody reads, unfortunately. So um, the results were interesting. They were, first of all, they were not significant. So as you can see, the error bars are huge here. So we didn't have, we didn't have results that we can actually um, conclude in a very uh, robust manner. But what it did show is that there, is, there was a tendency, um, which was that the awareness group uh, worked better than the control group and the online training worked better than everyone in getting people to not be re-victimized the second time. One of the reasons why we think these results were not significant is because Facebook, after one month and a half, uh, took our ads out because I think they considered that there weren't enough, enough uh, clicks or people buying it. But in fact, when we measured it, we, we saw that uh, 2,542 consumers ordered our coffee machine in that period of one month. And if they had actually paid for the machine, we would have made an income of 150,000 euros, 
which is quite crazy because this machine does not exist at all. And uh, the post-experiment survey showed that, that uh, most people found the campaign to be extremely beneficial and they, they had a very high recall of the rules of thumb we gave them. So they all, the, the, the two uh, not control groups, but the two other groups remembered all the rules to protect themselves online later. Uh, of course, everyone in the end of the experiment, including the control group, were informed about uh, the fact that this was a phishing campaign and uh, no one got harmed in this experiment. Uh, so right now we're working on uh, a training cycle for the inspectors of this administration and we're saying, okay, so we worked on the, uh, on the citizen part, but now we're working on how do the inspectors become better at um, uh, getting more uh, better informed um, fines, so when they write fines for these websites, how can they use information from cognitive science to, uh, to, to put, for, put forth the behavior levers that are being used uh, by, these, uh, uh, by these websites. So we're working on this cycle and it should be evaluated uh, by June, so in two months. Uh, so I'm seeing that uh, I'm taking, I'm running over time, but just to tell you that uh, these were some examples, selected examples that I wanted to show you, but we work on many other projects. So if there is anything from this list that you find uh, specifically interesting, I'd be happy to, to share it with you in the questions. Um, I thank you for your attention and uh, you can find all the information from all our projects on the website modernisation.gouv.fr. All the reports are there with the results. So don't hesitate to, to check them out if you're interested. Um, and so with this, I'll give the floor back to, to Nick and happy to answer all your questions. Thank you. Oh, merci, Mariam. Uh, thanks so much. It's, uh, it's amazing to see uh, all the work that has been done. And you only present it just like a tip of the iceberg, because uh, in all the different areas, um, and I have a bit of an insight. So. Uh, it, it's really, really amazing, uh, all the things you've been doing. I think this is response to an extent also to go around what you mentioned in the chat or asked in the chat. Um, is this BI uh, usually used, um, well, in service delivery or simplification kind of things? Or do we also have policy examples? There are plenty of policy examples in different policy areas. Uh, also great for Mariam because you shared, let's say, between brackets, the simple kind of BI applications, changing these forms and, and working a bit on digital uptake if you want. Um, but again, between brackets, simple, but then also showing some really uh, complex uh, policy related ones related to the repairing of, of goods or the repairability of goods. And then certainly this, the last one that you showed, I think this is really uh, quite revolutionary, uh, but Chiara can, can contradict me. I think this is really, uh, well, quite complex also in setting up um, the whole experiment, but it's really, really interesting to see the results. So thanks again for, for all of this. Um, so back to, to you, dear colleagues uh, online, if you would like to have a question or questions, um, then uh, please uh, go ahead. I see some questions in the chat. Um, Maybe, well, I would open the, the floor with, with you, uh, Minister. Uh, please, Milva, if you uh, uh, pose your question directly uh, to Miriam, uh, and then we can have the discussion. So please, uh, Milva. Thank you, Marianne. It was a very good presentation, very, very inspiring, so what you have done. But my question is how difficult it is to build up this uh, multi-expertise multi team. Uh, from which side of the public administration or engineering the experts are coming? Yeah, thank you very much for your question. I'm just going to take two seconds to plug my charger as it's not correctly plugged. I hope my computer doesn't turn off. I'll come back in two seconds. Sorry. Good. That, that's quite a cliffhanger, Miriam, that you're putting here. That's that's good. Great, but thanks, uh, thanks for this question already. Um, and so... Just waiting for uh, for Mariam to come back. Uh, do we all have another question that we can already line up the questions a bit while waiting for Mariam? Yes, I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, yes. So 
Yeah, thank you. So um, this is a very, it's a very good question. And it also maybe will allow me to tell you what we're also doing in terms of um, building um, the expertise in parallel. Because, um, so as I said, my background is in cognitive neuroscience, but um, it's, it was quite hard to convince administrations to actually um, hire this type of expertise, which is very specific. And um, I mean, it, it, it's it's really um, not a classical type of expertise that you see in public in public administration. So what we did is in 2018, uh, we also launched partnerships with universities. So two universities, one of them which is specialized in cognitive science, and the other one, which is much more generalistic, so public policy, so Sciences Po, for those who know Sciences Po, and École Normale Supérieure, which is the, the one that is more cognitive science related. And we created two programs in each of them. So in the public policy university, Sciences Po, we created a course. Uh, I co-created a course with a colleague that we, where we teach behavioral insights to um, these types of profiles. And the other, and the other one, uh, on the contrary, we teach public policy aspects to cognitive science students. And so this means that um, we can have, first of all, interns in our teams, which can then be hired uh, in the team as, as experts on, uh, on the eye. So right now we're trying, um, we are trying a program with two administrations uh, on which we, with which we have already worked with one project. So now they're convinced of the use of the eye. And we are the we proposed interns to them that we uh, pilot from our team. So this means that uh, after doing one project, they have an, they have on top of that one intern which works on a specific uh, BI topic, and it means that these interns can then be hired to create seed teams in those administrations. So this is one this is one of the ways that we use to spread this type of expertise within administration. But I but. I have to say that uh, it's an extremely um, complicated uh, topic because how to recruit the person who has at the same time the skills in, uh, in the scientific area, but also has the skills for all the public policy side and to coordinate with different administration and understand the administrative world is not easy. So we, uh, we've also had uh, errors in recruitment uh, at least once in the, in the past years. But um, yeah, it's a topic that I, I'm working on very actively with many administrations who are right now interested in hiring. Thanks, uh, thanks, Marianne, uh, for this. Maybe putting a question back to the audience. Um, if in your uh, countries, uh, administrations, uh, you have or are planning to work on this, uh, well, setting up such a team, even big or small, would be great maybe to to contribute um, in the chat or uh, just uh, open up the uh, the mic here. I think that would be really interesting to to share these uh, these experiences. So if anyone uh, would like to come in uh, with this or keep us informed now or later, uh, that would be great. So um, just... perhaps to answer also um, Goran's question in the in the chat. Um, so um, this is a this is also quite quite interesting what's going on in our team right now is that so far we were we were a bit more siloted. So the in a, behavioral science team was working on its own project, the design team had its own project, coaching, etc. And so um, last year we started uh, a new approach where we, we would really combine the expertise inside the team um, at different stages of a project. So for example, um, one of the projects we're doing right now is completely in collaboration with the design team. And they work with us on every part of the project, but they focus more, for example, on the prototyping part, and we will focus more on the evaluation part and the diagnostic part. So we're trying to see how to bring in all the other expertise, but it's it's very, very um, interesting to see how different uh, approaches can, can really um, completely uh, change the way the, the 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 way and the direction that a project takes because they're seeing it from an angle which we didn't at all uh, um, perceive initially. Mm -hmm. Can I just have a follow-up question, Mariam, on this? Um, 
you mentioned in the beginning the startup so the, the whole sunset clause yeah. period um where you reached out to administration saying well provide us with your questions your demands yeah? how do you work now do you uh initiate i mean reach out yourself so are you active proactive or are you working only solely on demand of uh, administrations coming to you how does it work yeah i would say that uh 90 percent of our work is uh coming from demands from administrations so uh i think we were i mean uh with all the humility that that, that i that i should take i think we kind of created a bit of a high demand so right now we're receiving a lot of demand more than we can actually handle um so i would say that's mainly what we get but we also some some of our projects are a bit more proactive uh, so, for example, right now we're doing a study on deter the determinants of pro-environmental behavior among public servants, and we did we're doing this a bit more proactively because we're we are uh, thinking that maybe uh, the strategies that the government will adopt to to do campaigns or other types of uh, actions for pro-environmental actions might be um might not be specific depending on pro-environmental behavior and we see that there's a lot of research on that so we're trying to say okay why don't we do a study and help you determine what type of strategy to adopt for each type of uh, of behavior so this one is like a more research project that's why it's proactive mm -hmm. um and also to answer the question in the chat again is like if we could create a new role within our team uh, to enhance the application of behavioral insights, what role would that be? Um, that's a very, very interesting question. Uh, very recently, so maybe like 10 days ago, we have uh, we had uh, we hired someone uh, new in our team, which is um, mainly uh, an expert in impact evaluation. So because this was something that we were lacking uh, as an internalized competence. So I think that's quite important. But maybe one thing which we don't have the time to do is to um, by administration um, kind of synthesize the literature on different topics that we're working on. For example, um, some administrations come to see us with a topic and they don't have necessarily the time or the reflex to go and see what has already been done on this topic. So there is a lot of reinvention of the wheel or reinvention of projects while there's already a lot of evidence on a lot of topics. So I think maybe like knowledge management is something that's extremely important. Uh, and how do you bring the information to the administration at the right time so that they don't start from scratch and really think that they are the first people who actually uh, started working on this topic? I think, yeah, we would bring a knowledge manager or a knowledge broker, if I can say it a bit more crudely. Uh, very, very good point, uh, Mariam. I, was, uh, I will come back on this. Uh, but first, I have a question, uh, or we have a question from Dominique uh, Dalmas here. Uh, pleased to have you uh, with us, uh, Dominique. Um, on the, I think you can see the question, uh, Mariam, on the interaction yeah. really with, with legal and, and regulatory yes. uh, changes. Yeah, voila, please. Yes. So um, often administrations comes to come to see us uh, at the end of a policy cycle. So. Uh, we put a regulation out, it's not working, we tried taxation, we tried campaigns, nothing's working, so please help us. And it's kind of like a band-aid or last resort type of um, uh, yeah, process, which is unfortunate because um, many of the projects that we work on, we find that maybe there are things in the regulation that were not necessarily clear. So right now we are working and we are adopting this approach of saying, we're not only going to work on the end uh, result, but we're going to go really up the policy cycle and see, is there anything we can suggest in the way regulation has been written, in the way the information is being given about the regulation? So I can give one quick example on that. We worked recently on night, light, uh, night illumination of shops. So in 2013, there was a regulation in France that uh, that a legal obligation to turn off your lights as a shop from 1 a.m. to 6 uh, to 6 a.m. and very little shops actually apply that regulation. So many of them stay uh, lit all night long. And when we went and reviewed the regulation, it's extremely written. It's written in a very very complex manner. There's a lot of exceptions according to what type of city you live in, in which road your your shop is. Um, there are also 
the way it's written is not user centric at all because you have to turn off the light at 1 a.m. While, while actually you close your shop maybe at 7 or at 8. So unless you have an automatic device, you're never going to go back to the shop at 1 to turn it off. So we're trying to work on how to simplify that regulation, how to make it earlier for some shops maybe, and also how to communicate about the regulation much more because many shops said they had no idea that this regulation existed and because they were never fined. And the reason they were never fined is because policemen at 1 a.m. had many other priorities than to go find shops that had their lights on. So sometimes the way the regulation is designed doesn't take into account human behavior and the incentives of each actor that needs to apply and make the regulation effective. So it's a very, very uh, big challenge for us, Dominique, and we're really heading in that direction right now. Thanks. Uh, thanks again, uh, Mariam. Um, I don't see any hands or questions in the chat. Uh, so thanks again, Mariam. And I think with this, uh, I'd like to then also move and hand over to Minister Economy from uh, Albania. Milva, it's always great to, to have you with us. And we're always pleased that you find time in your schedule um, to do this. I know that you're dedicated to the topic, but nevertheless, it's really appreciated. So really, really interested to hear your reflections, thoughts uh, about challenges, potentially, but also opportunities. I mean, what's your whole thinking uh, on this, Milva, please? Thank you so much, Nick. It's always very nice to be in your webinar uh, that you organize that are very interesting to topics always. But I would like to thank very much Chiara and Miriam because your presentation was so uh, mo motivated one and so make us thinking what we can do better in our realities. When I was preparing myself to participate in this webinar, I was reading a little bit about behavioral insight because even for me, this is a very general concept and I never have seen it in this slide that you have presented today. Uh, I also would like to use the, this opportunity to thank also RESPA, the Regional School for Public Administration that in a way is guiding Western Balkans to do better things and better job in public administration, especially in improving service delivery. And I would like to link uh, this behavioral insight with service delivery. But when I was thinking about Albania case, I started to think what we have done in the behavioral insight. And so I have taken the situation first in a very macro level, and then I went to a very meso level. In the macro level, in Albania, we have organized something that uh, the first one that is very much a survey directed to the people is that in the Council of Ministers of Albania, we have thought that it's a moment to reflect about policies that will help individual or families living in Albania with some other measure, fiscal or a social measure, uh, immediately after the crisis. And we have organized an uh, activity called national consultation that the questioner with uh, 12 questions, only 12, have been prepared and delivered to the people in different ways. It was, it is a pop-up in the website of the ministry. It is sent by emails to whom have a address in the e-services of Albania, e-Albania portal. And also it has been printed out. And uh, most, uh, most of the people has been answering through emails. Uh, only one fourth of the people have been answered through the hard copy. And the total, there were more than 6,100 persons that have reflected to this national consultation. And one of the main things that we've used out of the national consultation is a policy related to the women that are unemployed with three or more children. And this has been a new politics that we have immediately implemented in the country. So we are paying social benefit for those mother for a period that uh, the last small baby will go to the age of 18 years old. And so this was a, a national consultation that we have taken the insight of the people of territory of Albania, what they think for the policies. 
that we have to undertake. Another thing that was very important is a, a law that we passed in parliament and we have called co-governance. And in the co-governance, we have organized a platform when people can do different activities and those different activities are linked with some processes that is uh, you have to, to report your complaints, you have to uh, make a denounce, you have your own initiative, you have your, your, your word, you have to say something or say, you have uh, uh, your hearing, you have uh, my grade, you have my school, my business, our talk, and I want to contribute and my story. And different category of peoples are replying to that. For example, one of the things that we have organized through this co-governance is a measure that we have taken for the schools because parents were very much complained about the heavy of the school bags of their children. And it was part of my school and my, my say. A lot of parents were complaining. So we have come back in the government and we have considered that it will be better for the children of the age uh, from six to 10 that they are in the uh, first grade school to have three hours per day that will last 19 minutes maximum. So the, uh, the books that they will have in their school bag has to be less and the weight will be less. So this is how we have approached behavioral insight. Another thing that was very important in this uh, co-governance is a platform that is related with my, uh, my complaint. And my complaint is something that businesses or people in the territory of Albania can have and they must do uh, regarding the services the public administration is given to them and what they have to, to say. So when um, my complaints came in the platform, there is a unit in the public administration that is following these my complaints in all the administration and they have to see where the complaints has been blocked and they have to push for a fast answer. And so this has been used uh, very much. And I can say that the success rate of my complaints for the business has been about 27%. 27% of complaints has been solved through uh, this uh, platform. Another thing that is also very important in the case of Albania is how we have performed our services, public services. In Albania, we have, in, we have organized services uh, as a one-stop shop window and also online. But then from the 1st of May last year, every services is online. At the beginning, it was a uh, a lot of against, uh, people were not so comfortable with this kind of thing, but then we have had the unit that was giving to them um, support how to make the application. And the unit is open from eight in the morning up to eight in the evening. So people can have a lot of support how to make an e-application. And the, for the older people, it has been a filter about the services that they're getting and the we're reporting to them via a text message in their mobile. So it, this has been solved. But in the same time, we have to improve our platform inside. So there, today we have in Albania 58 national registers that are communicating with each other. So in the, in the real time, you can get information about everything that you are interested for in the services. And you have to see there that in the window of e-Albania, you have a description of your service for what you are going to expect out of this uh, application and how much time the application needs and uh, uh, the, the steps that you have to compile to get the application. So things are on web. But a part of that, we are working in two directions. The first direction is the quality of services. So we are preparing the index to, to measure the quality of these uh, services. And the second is an ongoing initiative to see how we have to re-engineer re those services. And this is a, a very multi-task force because uh, people that are working in the 
digital agencies and people that are working in the services agencies, but they are linked with each other, have to come and to think according how they can improve the engineering of the services. And in fact, uh, uh, there is, uh, we are not measuring the satisfaction yet, but in the EU Albania, there is a pop-up that you have to give some grades to the services. The majority of grades are maximum, but this doesn't mean that the people are satisfied. They are satisfied with a given service, but not with the services in general. So we would like to measure this type of satisfaction, how much they are satisfied. And for that, we are using several uh, channels. One of the channels is a survey that UNDP uh, is conducting in the country with some idea coming from OECD, trusting governance. And we have put a specific question in the questionnaire to see how satisfied are the Albanian people with this type of services. And also uh, we are, and this, this is high, but this year it has been a little, why is this decrease, decreasing in satisfaction? What happens? Uh, and another uh, measurement that we are doing is uh, we are seeing how much internet connection is now with a fast velocity uh, approaching the household. And this information is collected by Statistical Office of Albania. So we have these two other sources to see how well we are doing in uh, services delivery. A part of that in Albania, that is, a, is an agency that is called the Media Information Agency. And they are in charge of looking a little bit on the media, articles that are in written, articles that are online, but also they are introducing now some concept of artificial intelligence because they are looking to all the social media and they are collecting data about the profiles of the followers, of the readers and of those that have uh, complaints or are against a given uh, activity taken by the government. So this is also reported in the Council of Ministers to take some measure how we are going to improve and what we are going to improve. But this is what we are doing in Albania. But when I see your presentation, to me came in mind another issue. We have not this uh, system as you have in France, Mariam, but the process is a little bit decentralized. In the municipality level, uh, we have the so-called uh, Directory of Consum Consumer Protection. And the Directory of Consumer Protection, sometimes, not always, because this is not systematic, they take some measure. And I can bring here an example of Tirana municipality that is the capital of Albania regarding uh, regarding the education on of drivers in the in the traffic so usually it is very difficult as always in capital to park and in uh, and they have introduced two systems one system that is parking through um, sms you have to send an sms for having a public parking and you have to pay through the uh, through the application and if you are a good a good let's say person uh, the municipality will uh, favor you one hour of parking free and usually this make people that are parking in tirana much more eager to pay in the right time to pay to to park in the in the right place because they would like to have this and this is coming as a consumption idea as a consumer protection idea through the directory of municipality of Tirana. And another one is linked with the, uh, uh, Chiara, you present a case in, uh, if I'm not wrong, you present a case in uh, uh, somewhere in, in, in the globe, I cannot remember right now, uh, regarding fines. We are putting fines for the bed parking. And for the bed parking, if you are going to pay fines within five days, we have a discount. 
And in the page that they are giving to you, uh, the page is green when you have paid in discount. But, and if you are not paying with a discount, the page is red. But I don't know the data about how good this performance in red and green has been, uh, has been calculated in Albania. But there is something that is very decentralized. And I don't think that we ever have used this having a conjunctive person inside the public administration to see how we are going to present it better. I think that with e-services and with this introduction of uh, intelligence artificial in all public administration right now, it will come. It will come as a necessity because it will be like this. And I would like to thank very much Nick for organizing this uh, webinar because for me, that I'm quite new in this uh, experience and this uh, experiment that you have done it's very important to hear what you have discussed so far so thank you so much and a big thanks to you uh, milva for uh, shedding some light on what you have uh, what you have done what you're doing but also reflecting on, on some of the options so i think that's really uh, really appreciated and, and nice to hear yeah. just would like to to add that um I mean, if you see and hear the stories from, from Mariam and, and, and France in this case, um, yeah, having built up some capacity, some, uh, well, also some budget support there, uh, yeah, that it takes efforts. I mean, you don't just do this uh, like that on a, on a Monday morning, say, well, let's design some experiment. No, this takes time. It takes special competences as, and skills, as you, uh, as you said already. Um, and also um, some, some budgetary involvements. Nonetheless, and uh, I think this is also, I think one of the purposes of gathering here today and organizing this kind of, of webinars, several, if not many things have been tested uh, in certain places. As also Kiara has said, well, I mean, working on these tax forms, working on different kind of forms, many of these experiments and also what works uh, or has proven to work these things have been done in other places. Does not necessarily mean that you can simply copy and do this in your own, but still, you should also not start from scratch an empty page. I think that's my message, and, and I think all our message here, that with the, uh, I think the, the excellent work that is being done and is done by Chiara in bringing all these behavioral insight teams where they exist or interested persons uh, where they are in all, the countries online, I think that could be a great first step to yeah, get into this community, get into what is done, what is working. Maybe that can be inspirational also for your countries or your organizations. So um, with connecting in this way, all of you, that's also one of, of our uh, aspirations. Um, but I want to uh, also look back into the audience if they are, we're running close to the closing hour. But if there are still some questions from uh, colleagues online, this might be the good moment to uh, ask your question, questions to the um, speakers. I see Olivera. Uh, that's your hand, Olivera. Please, Olivera from Vespa. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you first for organizing this very, very interesting uh, webinar on, on topics that we are not uh, thinking about every day in service delivery, but it's actually we are living that I would say every consumer, every user has that in, 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 in as the part of using of the, of the services and thank you uh, the, the great uh, presentations really but without thinking, taking more of your time just to say also thank you to Miss uh, uh, Mrs. Economy for, for mentioning RESPA and our work in the region. We really try also to not address only the common issues that we are already are working consistently, also uh, uh, looking at Sigma's work and other organizations, but we also try to promote some innovative topics. And I see the, 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 the BI being one of them and RESPA is really very open. And as, as uh, Nick said, we, we don't have all to start from the scratch 
which they are practices known or less known. So RESPA is willing to support all the all the demands or the uh, from the Western Balkan in, in this in this context. So we are really encouraging our, our organizations from Western Balkans to approach us on this topic also. We would be really, really pleased to, to help through our instruments of the mobility schemes or on demand. Also, we are going to, 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 to increase our focus on innovative policies in, in the future. And uh, that's something I think that, that is the place where the BI certainly will find will find its place. So thank you again. And uh, I think this, this opens many, many other questions and also the similarities with economic uh, uh, issues on, on the consumer performances and how private sector and public sector can can also look at the, at the similarities in this in this context thank you very much thank you thank you olivera and just uh, launching a crazy idea on, on top of my hat um maybe it could be interesting to run a kind of a regional experiment in the western balkan region on a particular topic um where bringing the countries together joining some capacity joining some forces uh, supported by respa and the european commission um because well i mean cultural wise yeah this is the same right um and there could be some some really uh some some nice uh, nice positive spillovers uh, from from such a project, just an idea uh, on a uh, on a grey Thursday uh, lunchtime uh, moment. So, uh, but happy to reflect on this together. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, other uh, questions, interventions, things to raise to mention. This might be a good good moment. I see uh, uh, Goran in the chat. I'm just reading out your question, uh, Goran. Uh, it's targeted to Milva. Uh, would you consider introducing behavioral insights, conducting needs assessments, identifying gaps in service delivery, where BI may help, capacity building, pilot projects, scaling up projects, uh, reapplying the OECD checklist question and guideline in Albanian institutions, upgrading the quality service index, right? That's the question, go around. Okay. Please okay, move. so what what I can uh, what I can answer to that is that in fact we are uh, we are considering very much improving the quality of uh, e-services that we are delivering, and for that, recently in Albania we have uh, because as you mentioned, as Marian mentioned, as Kara mentioned, is also linked with the possibility of uh, financing projects that you would like to use to ameliorate the delivery. And in the case of Albania, to have some more financial support, we have applied in the framework of the project of the World Bank to have a component on digitalization and uh, improvement of services delivery. So here we are now in the, in the quite ending phase of the project proposal. And this has been approved in the board of governors of uh, World Bank by middle of March, so we are quite advanced in this in this point of view, and we have to think about what will be the the new phase of service improvement and what will be a new phase of using uh, BI and checklist of the BI in the improvements of e-services. So everything is ongoing, but. Uh, uh, Behavioral insight is very new, so this has to be added in all these components. Thanks, uh, thanks once once more, Vilpa. Uh, we have a question from Jovana from CEP. Please, uh, Jovana. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Jovana. I am a senior project manager at the European Policy Center uh, CEP Belgrade. I would like to thank uh, Ms. Economy, uh, Ms. Varazani, and uh, Ms. Uh, Shamat for their very useful presentations, uh, and also Sigma for inviting us to attend the webinar. It's very useful for the sort of work we do at, uh, at CEP as a think tank and as civil society. Uh, so I would like to make more of a comment, actually connect what I've heard uh, today to the work we do within our regional initiative for monitoring public administration reform in the Western Balkans. Uh, 
so um, it's our work we do uh, with gathering citizens' input on uh, the quality of public services administrations provide in the region. It's not uh, necessarily based on the behavioral insights uh, principles that we heard today, but it's definitely a good ground to uh, reconsider the approach we had to the citizens' campaign we implement, we implement within the project. Genie, so, Kegati. Aha, uh -huh, sorry, this was, uh, okay. Uh, so basically I was thinking about the, the approach we used in the citizens campaign about uh, promoting the campaign to citizens to leave their experiences online on our platform, which is digital. And um, basically we tested this online, but uh, in most of the cases uh, we had uh, a bigger turnout when we had volunteers and local activists uh, do the exit polling in front of the institutions. Uh, so the um, feedback we received through the platform um, was actually not that detailed and people were not uh, that open to typing the exact experience and details of their experience uh, that uh, they had in contact with public administration and service providers. Uh, compared to the um, surveys and questionnaires we got from the local activists who had direct contact with people in front of the institutions who were exiting institutions and just had the contact about the service they, they obtained from the administration. So uh, we are still uh, implementing the citizens campaign. It's still ongoing. Uh, we are trying to do all the social media call uh, to actions, uh, promote the campaign, uh, already shared the experiences the citizens left to the portal. Uh, but um, I think that using social norms, the, the examples Chiara and Mariam shared through the examples uh, from their project, I think that would be helpful uh, because it would motivate people to maybe um, open up and leave their experience. Like it would be a good, uh, good um, uh, rationale to, to, to try to, to, to have a bigger turnout. And... Um, and yes, so our idea is once we collect the target of 10,000 experiences from all six countries in the Western Balkans, we do the analysis. We already done the first round of analysis last year uh, that is based on 4,000 uh, experiences from citizens from the Western Balkans. So uh, this spring um, uh, until June this year, we are collecting uh, the, the, the experiences and uh, we hope that once we achieve the target of 10,000, we will uh, produce the second round of analysis that we will, um, with of course recommendations. So this would be purely based on citizens' feedback in all categories of service provisions. And we will try to advocate for those recommendations with the decision makers. So we will really try to set bilateral meetings with the decision makers in all six administrations and uh, and share with them what the citizen feedback is. So yes, that's our experience on the topic uh, that is very uh, young. Uh, we've just start, started working on it. Uh, but uh, as I said, uh, the, the, the webinar was very useful and all the tools, websites and um, the, the guides you, you shared, I think that we are going to be able to use it in our work more especially in the future period uh, where we are trying to come up with the um, policy lab concept of our Weber initiative. And we will try to um, test the uh, different kinds of methodologies and maybe behavioral insight principles uh, would be very good to, to, to consider them when planning these future activities of work we do on Weber. Thank you very much once again. Thank you, Jovana, for the kind feedback, uh, but also for sharing uh, the interesting work that uh, that SAP is doing uh, in the region. So great to hear that it's always useful and that it can really can boost and also uh, be introduced um, and update the work that uh, that all of you are doing. Uh, great to hear. Super. I'm just having a, a look um, through the audience. I don't see any uh, hands being raised. I don't see any and new inputs in the chat. So I think with this, um, allow me just to, to then conclude uh, by first of all, thanking uh, all of you to be online. Uh, it's it's really great to see um, this continuous um, attention to uh, 
attending these uh, these webinars first second thanks a lot to uh to the speakers uh ladies um really really appreciate it uh really great uh that you are available that you contributed in such a nice way uh lastly i want to uh, repeat what i said in the beginning that um this is the first one in a series uh the next one we will be um holding and i can maybe just quickly share the screen so that uh this uh -huh. so this is the first one um on behavioral insights we will do uh the next one on ai in uh june the date needs to be confirmed but uh, this will be soon uh, will be done this as you can imagine um will be super interesting as well and uh, liaises nicely with with this one uh, so you will be informed um, about the agenda and the time and date then after summer we will do a dedicated one related to omni and multi-channel approaches strategies uh, in service design and delivery and then we will close off this year's series with an update what the eu colleagues are doing on the ai does uh, interoperability, new interoperability acts, identity interoperability. So uh, all of this, but also on these ones, you will be kept uh, informed. I just would like to close um, in saying that if you have um, topics that you would like to well see programmed yourself, if you say, well, it would be great, Sigma, if you could organize uh, a topic, a seminar on this, feel free to reach out. I mean, you have our contacts, uh, just get in touch with us and we're happy to um, to liaise, to collaborate, involving uh, also RESPA in these kind of exercises. I mean, just reach out. Uh, also, if you have something to offer, if you say, well, we have like done something great in our organization, in our country, um, that we as Sigma might not be aware of, this happens, but still, uh, just reach out to us and say, well, just, well, maybe it could be nice, uh, colleagues, um, if we could present on this or that, it's very easy to schedule these kind of meetings. So uh, just inform us in both ways with questions, offers, demands, uh, have always happy to do this. With all of this, I think we have um, used our time. Thanks so much again. Thanks uh, big time again for the speakers. Thanks to all of you. Looking forward to see you uh, in your countries or to see you in Paris one day. Um, but we stay in touch uh, and we will follow up in sharing all the materials uh, and in keeping you informed on the next uh, webinars and events that we're doing. Thanks again. Have a great day, a great weekend ahead, and then we'll be in touch. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao.